Hello everyone, uh, I hope you're all doing well, and today I'm going to be talking about reconstructing tablet weaving patterns that are found in the wall art of uh, an ancient Etruscan tomb in Tarquinia. My name is RJ Palmer, I'm from the University of Kentucky by the way. Uh, so what is tablet weaving and, and what is this experiment? Tablet weaving is itself is a type of weaving that uses these small tablets or cards uh, to twist the warp threads or the horizontal, the, the vertical threads into some geometric patterns. These tablets are typically square with a hole in each corner for the thread to pass through. Uh, each tablet creates a column and these tablets can, the, the tablet woven objects can be dozens of tablets wide. They can be a handful. The more tablets you use, the wider you get. Uh, this type of weaving is common throughout ancient Europe. It's used in conjunction with loom weaving and it's used separately as well. It's a very good experiment to archaeology projects because we have examples of it from many different cultures. The majority of tablet weaving tends to come from northern Europe. Uh, both the Iron Age and the later medieval periods have quite a lot of examples, or the early medieval periods later than the Iron Age. Have a lot of examples of it that have been researched more fully than the ancient Mediterranean ones. So this experiment is looking at some extant finds from the ancient Mediterranean, from Etruria specifically, as well as trying to create possible patterns based on wall art that would have been seen in Etruria. Uh, so the Etruscans uh, themselves, the people of Etruria, are a pre-Roman northern Italian civilization, mostly in what is now Tuscany today, although there's a few extra regions that they used to inhabit. They were a major economic power in the ancient world before the Romans, and they have a lot of visual depictions of themselves. Uh, many of the wall art, some in tombs, some in other places, and many of their other art, shows really unique and dazzling clothes, lots of bright colors, lots of very fancy weaving techniques, um, which can be backed up with some remaining archaeological evidence, although, of course, they existed 2,500 years ago, so the textiles often don't last that long in good condition. A lot of their larger loom-woven textiles included tablet weaving as a part of them. Primarily the hem and the heading band where you would attach the warp threads to the loom itself. But tablet weaving can also be used for things like belts or headbands or a whole bunch of different objects. And so here you can see my experiment in tablet weaving or one of the experiments. You can see the little wooden tablets at the top and you can see the pattern that they makes. So while this experiment doesn't quite go over gender and the roles of who's working on it, I do think it's important to at least talk about who is actually doing this work. Textile work in uh, ancient Etruria and the Etruscan civilization is generally considered women's work, which is similar to a lot of the Mediterranean, although not every aspect of it. It's certainly similar to the Greco-Romans in that respect. But they have different gender roles and different rights and status than the Greco-Romans did. Uh, women in general had a lot more rights in ancient Etruria and seemed to be a much larger part of society. They could go to parties, they could do a lot of what they wanted to. And this extends to their fiber crafting. All aspects of textile work was considered very valuable by the Etruscans, um, including things like spinning wool, which in ancient Greece and Rome would be considered enslaved people or servants or young children's work. Uh, so we can see their high social status and their relatively more relatively equal rights uh, extend to their work and to how much value is placed upon it. So spinning yarn, uh, as I mentioned, is the the basis of all textile work primarily. Uh, in the northern Italian country, uh, wool and linen are the primary fibers or were the primary fibers used. There are some examples of others, but for this experiment, I chose to use wool and I spun all of the wool used on a, two replica drop spindles. There's an example of one there and there is the spindle itself, or the spindle whorl itself. They're terracotta, 14 grams, uh, based on some archaeological finds in northern Italy. 
I spun it in three primary colors, two are natural wool colors, the cream or white and the dark brown are just the wool color right off the sheep. Uh, the orangey red is a matter dyed color. It was quite common in the ancient Mediterranean as a dye. And you'll see in a second, the tomb that I'm basing off of, this off of uses a lot of red paint. So I use that to represent it. Each thread is between 0.3 and 0.4 millimeters on average. Although some variation exists as it's hand spinning. Uh, for the most part, these threads are spun together to make two ply yarn. Uh, because of the twisting nature of tablet weaving, two ply yarn is often required. If you use a single thread, it will fray apart quite easily. So each thread is 0.3 to 0.4 millimeters on average. Together, they make a little bit of a thicker yarn, but not significantly thicker. It doesn't double the volume. Uh, and so the art that I am looking at specifically is the Tomb of the Triclinium. It's this relatively well-preserved, I'm going to move my little screen here, uh, tomb that depicts the ancient Etruscans as their partying. Um, these Etruscans wear fairly brightly colored clothing, a mixture of indigenous style and Mediterranean style. And while I say it's excellently preserved, it's excellently preserved in the fact that we still have it. Obviously, it's been a long time. The paints eroded. There are areas where it's been destroyed by elements, by the archaeological team, not, not directly, but by the excavation, by a whole lot of things. It's been moved as well from its original location. Um, so it's excellent that we just have it at all. But we can take a lot from this and from the Lucado that was taken during the excavation by Carl Ropsey. Uh, many of their clothes involve some type of tablet woven hem. Uh, mostly you can see at the very edges of the clothing, you'll see the cloth is one color and then you get the secondary color right at the edge. That would be the tablet woven aspect. We know this because in the extant archaeological finds and the few textile examples we have, this is how the te the tablet weaving is used on the very edge. And we also know that it tends to contrast with the color of the main garment. So you see these two people are wearing a light blue, used to be a much darker blue. So the contrast is a light red and white. And you see all these white dresses or tunics. Uh, the dress itself is white and you have this darker red tablet woven border. And on these darker cloaks, you have this white border as well. So they're generally fairly easy to pick out uh, when looking at this type of wall art because they contrast so much against the loom woven cloth in color. And that was deliberate in the part of the Etruscans. Uh, so this is the left portion of the wall. And I'm going to show the right portion next. Uh, there is the center of the wall as well, although I had to limit what I was doing. And I don't even do all the patterns used on the people here because each person generally has at least one or two patterns to their tablet. One or two tablet woven patterns on them, depending on how many clothes they're wearing. Some have more. So, um, and you can see here, this dark red pattern is a very clear example of a tablet woven object used as a belt or some type of band. Uh, and then you can see more of the blue and the red and the white uh, clothes with their contrasting tablet woven colors. And I'm pretty sure this part is even a tablet woven belt, although I, I would double check that. Um, so the scope of this was to take some of the patterns seen here and recreate them using this hand spun yarn, and then also recreate a pattern that can be replicated by other people uh, to further disseminate the information here. So there are five patterns that are used. I'm going to briefly go over them. This is a zigzag pattern. Uh, the actual piece was eroded quite badly, um, but in the Lucado by Carl Ripsey that I mentioned, uh, it can be seen pretty easily. This is a fairly small pattern. Those do exist. There's an extant find of eight tablets, so I went with seven tablets here, um, and I think it came out pretty good overall. Now, some of these belts and bands would have been much wider than this. This is a fairly narrow band, but some were the size and, and many used on hems for clothing would be quite small. Um, this 
square snake or this Greek key pattern is something that exists throughout the Mediterranean and it can be seen uh, in many different mediums and styles on pottery and everything else. This pattern, unlike the other pattern, can be scaled quite a bit wider very easily. And you can do that by either adding more margins to each side. You can add more of the white columns to each side, or you can add one or two more tablets to that seven or eight pattern and make the actual key itself wider. And in both cases, you would see examples of wider and thinner ones. This is another one of those free-flowing ones in between these two figures here. So you can vaguely see the outline here. Uh, the pattern is clear but faded in the original. And then the last of these free-flowing belts that I replicated is the solid red pattern. It is something that uh, can be reconstructed with an extant archaeological find. There is a tablet band that has been recovered with those 13 tablets wide uh, with this alternating pattern solid color. Uh, the other thing that was very interesting is that this is the only thing that was not double plied uh, as the original was not double plied and I didn't want to, I wanted to replicate the original except for the color, uh, which I based on this piece. That was very difficult to do. Um, the th thread kept fraying and I've tried to choose in this case, one of the better sections that was very clear to see what was going on because a lot of the rest of this band was quite deteriorated. Uh, but that is my skill, not the skill of the original people who the original band was uh, without flaw, I think uh, Kniston, uh, Knudsen says. Uh, and the circle and line pattern here, this is a pattern that is seen on several different figures with some variations. Uh, my experiment and the pattern that I used that you can see here it led to a much more oval than circle pattern, but it is quite clear and quite visible. I'm going to, in the final project here, uh, adjust it to be more circular, but I think it came out quite well, and I like the way that the colors contrasted with this natural dyeing. Um, and then the last pattern here is another pattern that is seen on several different figures. I chose one and tried to replicate the exact one that was on hers, but you could take these triangles and use them on different figures that are seen. This triangle pattern is uniquely Etruscan. We see it on other aspects of their clothing as well as in other bands. Uh, the bars are supposed to be much more like what you see in the, the pattern that I drafted, uh, and they don't turn out that way. I'm also going to alter that to try to make it much clearer in the final project. So using both art history and archaeology when possible can give a much clearer view on textile patterns and usage, especially when talking about ancient cultures when the textiles don't always exist anymore. Uh, this can give us a view into what they could have made based on what they do. This isn't necessarily an exact one-for-one -one replication of an archaeological find. This is a view of the patterns that they like and the shapes that they like, as well as the colors. Also, by uploading these into accessible modern patterns software, the textiles can become much better replicated and much better researched, and they can allow a broader audience to interact with the ancient world uh, without having to, to necessarily have the knowledge of scholars. They can just access these much more easily. So the photo rights, uh, all the photos of the experiment were taken by me. All the patterns used, all those drafting patterns, were created using the Tablet Weaving Draft Designer, which is an excellent website and online tool. Uh, they are a free service without copyright, and I just wanted to plug them because they're great. Uh, you should use them for all your tablet weaving needs and recreations. The tomb of the Triconium and the photos are from the Museo Nacional Etrusco, and I want to thank them for allowing me to access those. I want to thank Exarch and the moderator for uh, giving a platform here and for doing everything that they do. Uh, and then lastly, I want to go through the bibliography. And if anybody has any questions, uh, we're going to have a question session at the end. So thank you for listening. And I am going to end the video here.